Well, last week I shared with you the first part of a three-part series called All Aboard. We're looking at three ships during this series. Last week was the topic of ownership and how God is really the owner of everything in life. He, he made it all. He made the world. He made the universe. He made us. And so we belong to him. And if you were here last week, you received a little prayer guide. And we've been following this, this this past week. It's been on Facebook every day, a little prayer thought just to help you stop and pray. In fact, uh, the one for today is, I praise you, Father, for every good and perfect gift comes from you. And it's all about relationship and how God is our Father and we are his children. And so uh, we're looking at these to because I believe these words have a huge impact on our relationship with the Lord. Um, when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you enter into a new family relationship where God becomes your father and you become his son or daughter. Now, everyone in this room understands what it's like to be a son or daughter. You were one at one time or you are one right now. And then some of us also have the privilege of being on the other side of it, of being a mother or father. And it doesn't matter if you're mom or dad, you understand what it's like to be a parent with children. And one of the principles I learned a long time ago that really helped me in parenting is to realize that over the course of raising a child from birth to the time they leave your house is a transition of moving from rules to relationships. So I want you to look at this picture here. And when a child is born, we're really heavy on the rules. And the rules are things like, don't do this, no, you can't have that. And so we're constantly telling our little toddlers, no, don't, right? It's constant no stuff. Like, don't touch that. Don't eat that. Don't put that in your mouth. Don't cross the street. You know, constantly we're just telling them what not to do because they don't know the boundaries yet. And we're trying to protect them. And we don't really take time to explain the rules because they're not really at the place where they can understand. So if you have a two-year-old who's just really starting to develop walking and you really tell them that, no, no, you don't go in the street without holding mommy or daddy's hand, right? It's a pretty strong rule. And you're not gonna, you, you don't need to explain it. You just obey my rule because I'm protecting your life. And so it feels sometimes when you have a preschooler that you're nagging your kids all the time. Because you are. You're the, you're the reminder and the enforcer of the rules. And what you're trying to do is, is create a, a behavior, a a way of life where they're practicing the behaviors that one day you hope they'll own. And so brushing their teeth, doing their homework, going to bed at a certain time, eating their vegetables, not punching their brother, sister, all that kind of stuff is good for them. And as they get older, you start to explain why that is. You know, you brush your teeth because you want your teeth to last. You only get so many of them. And then when you lose them the second time, they're gone forever. So you want to take care of them. You want to do your chores because God wants us to, to contribute so you do your work, you do your part, and someday you'll get a job and you'll learn that you get paid when you do your chores. And so you, you start to share the reasoning behind these values because as the kids start to get the reasoning, your hope is they'll, they'll adopt it as their own, not just because it's the rule. I brush my teeth because it's the right thing to do. It's good for me. It's healthy. It's appropriate. It's not because I, I get punished if I don't do it. It's because I want to do it. It's good for me. And what, they, what they're transitioning into is I... I believe you, Mom. I believe you, Dad. I trust that what you're teaching me is good. And so I'm doing it because of my relationship with you. And now as kids start to, to live that way, we start to ease up on the rules. Now they get them. They're behaving. And pretty soon we say, okay, you can go over to your friend's house and spend the night. Or you can choose the clothes you want to wear to school. Or you can pack your own lunch. Or you can have time on the Internet or watch TV shows. Or you can have a cell phone. So we give them privileges and more freedom, and less rules. And as long as they continue on that path to keep kind of walking that line of, yeah, we're doing the right thing for the right reasons, we just keep opening it wider and wider. Now, if our kids misbehave and they show they can't be trusted with the freedom, we pull back and we enforce more rules again. Okay, I'm taking the phone from you. You can't go to your friend's house. You better come home right after school. More rules. But you don't want to stay there. If, if you have a ton of rules with a teenager, I'm telling you, it's, a, it's your house atmosphere isn't real pretty because you don't want to you want to get to where they're 18 you have you have you've freed them up now because they're going to be out of your care hopefully they develop those values they're they live that way they're living freely and here's what's so cool is they're doing the things you used to have rules to do but they're not doing it because of the rule they're doing it because it's just the way of life now the the rules are replaced by the relationship because the rules are embraced by the relationship their respect for you, their love for you makes them want to do the right thing because it's good for them too. It's not just because if I don't do it, I'm going to get disciplined. Does that make sense? So I want you to think about that in your relationship with God. 
In the Bible, it says that in the Old Testament, the Old Testament is basically God's law. And the law is a set of rules. It's a bunch of rules. God, God showing spiritually immature people what his values are, how to live. Don't eat this. Don't talk to, don't do that. You know, all these do's and don'ts. And so the, the Israelites grew up with that. But when Jesus came, it opened up a whole new relationship with God. In fact, here's uh, what it says in Galatians chapter 3, verses 24 and 25. Um, it says, so then the law was our guardian until Christ came. Some of your Bibles will say the law was our schoolmaster or the law was a tutor, meaning the law was temporary. The law was in place for a season to get us to the place where Christ now, our faith in Christ would take over. In other words, the law was replaced by your relationship with God. When you trust Jesus, you enter into a relationship with the Father. That relationship now becomes that guiding force in your life. Not that the laws were bad or the laws don't matter. It's just my relationship with God has replaced them because it's embraced them. And so this relationship with God where God is my Father and I am his child, that is the essence of the Christian life. Learning to walk with God as your Father and, and me as his child. That's what discipleship is. And so it affects every area of our, our spiritual lives. For example, I, I worship God as a loving father. And so he's not a judge on a cloud. He's not some distant power. He's my heavenly father. And so it affects worship. It affects prayer. Jesus says you can approach God now as your welcoming father. The door's open. You can come into his room and talk to him. Why? Because he's your father. You never knew that was open before, but now it is. Why? Because of your relationship with Christ. And it also affects our approach to giving. See, God is a generous father. And when you understand that, giving takes on a whole new perspective. So I want to talk to you today, and I want to convince you that it's far better to have relationship-based giving than rule-based giving. In fact, there's some failings with rule-based giving, and I want to start there today. The failings of rule-based giving. Now, when I say that, and some of you might be a little offended by what I'm going to say, but I'm going to ask you to, to follow me through on this and then check your own Bibles to verify it, because I think you'll be shocked at what you find. When I say rule-based giving, I'm talking primarily about what we've grown up with, learning that, hey, if you're a good Christian, you should tithe. That's what Christians do. They tithe. Now, I grew up hearing that in church, had no clue what it was, but tithe means I give a tenth of what God gives me. And, and churches, when they have offerings, will sometimes say, we're going to collect our tithes and our offerings. Tithes is, is I'm giving God the first 10%, and offerings are anything above that to special funds within the church. And I've learned that throughout my life, but I really began to practice that as a young adult. Even before Julie and I married, I determined, you know what, I want to do the Christian thing. I want to, I want to be a good Christian, so I'm going to start tithing. And if God allows me, you know, extra money, I'm going to give to other things. And I've been doing that for the last 40 years, and it's been a good discipline. In fact, I would encourage that discipline for young people. Start, start honoring God with that first uh, tithe, the 10%. But I think uh, our understanding is somewhat flawed, somewhat flawed. See, here's the verse that uh, really lays the foundation. It's found in the, the book of the law, Leviticus. It's in Leviticus chapter 27. Every tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the trees, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. And every tithe of herds and flocks, every tenth animal of all that pass under the herdsman's staff shall be holy to the Lord. 10% of your animals, 10% of your produce that you raise. This was an agrarian society, so they didn't go to work and get a paycheck. Typically, their, their payment was through livestock and through the fruit of the, of the crops that they grew. So they would give a tenth of that to the Lord. That belonged to him. In fact, it says it's holy to the Lord. Holy means it is set apart from everything else and says this is God's portion. It doesn't mean that it's better than, than the other portions. It doesn't mean that it's mystically magical. It just means that's God's part. Holy means set apart. It's like if you have dishes in your house that you set apart for special occasions, or if you have a, set of, a pair of shoes or earrings or a suit, you say, hey, I bring those out for special occasions. That's, that's holy. It's set apart for something. This portion is set apart for the Lord. Now, what did God do with that? Well, in this passage here, it went to the Levites. The Levites were the ones who were the priest in the tabernacle or the temple who offered the sacrifices, who helped teach, who really were like, kind of like the clergy of that day. And so the 10% the came in. That supported their work so they didn't have to go out and have farms 
to raise money. They, their work was the work of the temple or the tabernacle. And so the people's tithe helped them. In fact, there's a, there's a passage in, in the book of Nehemiah where people had failed to give their tithes and it was causing the Levites to have to go get jobs. They couldn't fulfill their work in the temple. And so God says, this is how I'm going to provide for them. That makes sense. It sounds reasonable. Uh, this was the Levitical tithe. But here's the part where it gets real interesting. You may never have heard that there was actually a second tithe. I didn't know this until a couple of years ago. That there actually was a second tithe that that Jewish people were commanded to give every year. It was called the festival tithe. It was a tithe that was given not to the priest, but to the celebrations that they would have annually, the big gatherings of their people, and it allowed them to get the food and provide for all the resources for their whole kind of community to come together to celebrate special events. You know, the festival of the booths, um, you know, eventually festival of Passover, though that wasn't uh, happening at, quite at the time. A lot of different fa- festivals, they were in place at that time. So that was a second tithe. You can read about it in Deuteronomy 14, but then there was another tithe. This was given every third year. This was a tithe that was called a welfare tithe. It was given specifically not to the priests, not to the festivals, but to help the poor in the land. So every third year, they would take another 10% and give it, put it in a fund, and that was distributed to the poor that were in their community. So if they were doing that every third year, that would be another three and a third percent. So technically, the, the, a good Jewish family tithe 23 and a third percent. You say, I never heard that before, Pastor. You're making this up. I'm not. You can, you can read it up online. You can look it up in the Old Testament. You can read on books on tithing. It, it's true. That's what the Jewish people did. Well, how can we never hear that? Well, it's hard enough to challenge people to tithe. It's really hard to challenge people to tithe like this. So we don't. And, and so when we talk about tithing, we say, like, well, I'm just going to take one of the tithes. I'll do the 10% one. That's going to be the tithe we do. And so that's what we're accustomed to. In fact, uh, we often quote the book of Malachi where uh, the, the people are urged to bring the full tithe into the storehouse because if they're not, they're robbing God. But, you know, I just want to be cautious because sometimes here's where the rules become trouble. I like the rules when I'm obeying them. I don't like the rules when they make me look guilty. And if, if, I'm, if I'm guilty, if I'm not doing 23 and a third percent, and I'm robbing God, I don't like to hear that. And so many faithful Christians would be shocked to say, you've shortchanged God if you're trying to do what the Jews did because you're not even doing that much. So it's dangerous sometimes for us to hold the standard over and say, I'm, I've arrived because I'm tithing when the Jews did even more than what we consider tithing. It's 23 and a third percent. Same time, we think, well, doesn't it say in Malachi that if you don't, you're under a curse? If you're in Christ, the curses have been removed. Jesus, it says, has become a curse for us. You're not going to be cursed if you don't tithe. 10% or 23%. I just want to assure you, you're not going to be cursed. You may miss out on blessings, that's for sure. You're not cursed. Jesus suffered the curse for us. Now, we're going to look at that for those of us who, like me, grew up tithing and said, I, I, can, I can testify, God has blessed my tithing. He has poured out. He's opened up the windows of heaven. I verify it. I can vouch for that. Yes, but maybe you're looking at the wrong scripture. Maybe it's not because you're tithing. Maybe it's because of something else Jesus says, which we'll look at in just a moment. See, tithing was never the goal. It was just the foundation See, even in the Old Testament, when they did those tithes, on top of that, they gave burnt offerings. They gave, and these were all free will. Burnt offerings, sin offerings, guilt offerings were all free will. You didn't have to. You could if you wanted to. Also, if they were building, like when they built the temple, they could give to that freely. Again, a free will offering. If people today think that, you know, churches or God is always asking for money, you should have been a Jew in the Old Testament. They're always giving something, always, always presented with an opportunity to give. And it's, it's, the danger can be we can get into a ritual, well, well I did what the rule said, so I'm, I'm safe, or I'm, I made God happy, he's going to get off my back, I'm not going to be cursed. Whew. I did, I did the 10%. But even then, we wrestle with, is that 10% of gross or net? Is that for 10% of all the gifts I get, bonuses, birthday gifts? I, I don't know. And we can be very legalistic. And that's the, the danger. See, Jesus came across the Pharisees, and in, in the only two times Jesus talked about tithing was in reference to Pharisees. And one of them was a parable. 
The second one was a challenge. See, the Pharisees came to Jesus, and they were, they were keepers of the rules. If there's anybody that kept the rules, man, they were good. They washed their hands when they were supposed to, even when they weren't supposed to. I mean, they, they didn't do stuff on the Sabbath they weren't supposed to do, and they made sure they didn't do hardly anything on the Sabbath because they didn't want to break that rule. They're very good at rule keeping. And when it came to tithing, well, listen to what they did. Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. These guys were so like meticulous with obeying the Lord that they didn't just tithe from the harvest. They didn't just tithe from the animals. They, they went into the cupboards and said, you know, the, let's get the dill out. A tenth of that goes to the Lord. Garlic salt and then my steak rub, 10% of that goes to the Lord. I mean, we're, we're going to obey it to the to an nth degree. And so they, they're trying to show Jesus just how good they are keeping the rules. And, G, it, and you need to know this. Jesus never says that it was bad. He says, you, you should have done that. That was okay. But, but you missed the weight of your things. Mercy, justice, faithfulness. Those are the things you really needed to to step it up on. So again, he never condemns tithing. He doesn't say you shouldn't do it, but he also doesn't say that that's a requirement for a follower of Jesus. In fact, no apostle in the New Testament as a writing to new Christians and churches ever even mentions tithing. So you wonder like, oh, where did it go? What happened to it? Jesus presented a different picture. In Luke chapter 6, he says, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. It's like Jesus said, you know what? Some of you are being held back by tithing. I want to do even more for you. If you give, I will give back to you more than what you give to me. You're going to give a thimble full, I'll, I'll, I'll fill your thimble till it's spilling over. You give a bucket, I'll give you your bucket filling over. It's going to spill over. He says, you give to me, I'll use that same measurement. I'll pack it down. I'll shake it, make room for more, put even more in it so that's spilling over the top. And you'll actually hold out your, your cloak uh, as your lap to catch the extra. That's what I want to do for you. So his question for us is, how much do you want from the Lord? I'm not talking just money, just this God's blessing. How much do you want from the Lord? You get to decide. Nobody's going to twist your arm. Nobody's going to say you have to do this. Jesus says you get to choose. And some of us, I think, go around saying, well, God, God's trying to really, you know, cheat me out of stuff. And, and I think you've got a wrong perspective of what God wants to do. Because God wants to be very generous to you and to me. But we're so fearful. And sometimes I think we, we shortchange ourselves but saying, well, okay, I'm going to grind it out and do the, the minimum. I'm going to do the tithe. Hopefully that, that makes God happy. And, and you start to see blessings in your life. But what if you said, hey, I'm, I do this willingly, cheerfully. I love doing this. In fact, sometimes I do even more because God has blessed me. See, we want to move from a rule-based giving to the freedom of relationship-based giving. Moving from I have to do this to be a good Christian to I get to do this because I'm a child of God. That's why the Bible says in the New Testament, it doesn't say the freedom means we shouldn't give or like, whew, that's off my back. God doesn't expect me to give anymore. He does expect you to give. In fact, we're even challenged, grow in the grace of giving. But the motivation is different. It's not just because I want to obey the rules. It's because I love my father. See, I give because my father has first given to me. I was thinking this week of how generous God is. Uh, Elon Musk, you guys know him? He's, he's the CEO of Tesla. He's got a lot of inventions around. And one of them is he's uh, in production of building this spacecraft called SpaceX, which his hope was one day that it'll be like commercial flights. You can actually fly into outer space on his aircraft. And I got to thinking, like, where in the, where in the universe would I want to go? The most beautiful stuff is right here on planet Earth. There is no place in, on any of the planets that, that compares to what we have on Earth. Have you ever seen the, the TV documentary called The Blue Planet? There's a, there's a Blue Pla Planet 2 out now, and I was watching a preview of it, and it takes you under the water because most of the Earth is water, and all the creatures under the water, starfish, seahorses, whales, fish, dolphins, uh, octopuses, I mean, all these different 
creatures made by God that dazzle us, that delight us. Go to a zoo. Look at the animals. Doesn't it, does it, don't you marvel at all that God had made? You don't find anything like this anywhere else in the universe, just here on planet Earth. The birds that are flying, the mountain scenes that we have, the stars in the sky. I mean, the beauty on this earth, it's as if God says, I'm going to show you how much I love you. I'm going to give you things that will dazzle your senses, dazzle your imaginations, things that will make you go, wow. And he did it. Why? Because of us. He did it for us. And then, and then God takes his people when they've rejected him, he saves them and says, I'm going to bring you into a land called the promised land. And when you get there, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, when I used to hear that, it sounded kind of gross, like oozy, sticky rivers, you know, land flowing with milk and honey. That doesn't sound real delightful, but it's just a picture of the fact that the cows are real healthy and the, and the vegetation is really good because the bees are happy and they're pollinating It's really a picture of the abundance of that land. He says, I'm bringing you into a land of plenty, and it's for you. God wanted to bless his people. And now when we give our lives to Jesus Christ, Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. He says, I've come to give you life. And you know what kind of life? Abundant. Abundant. God doesn't want us just to squeak by. He says, I want you to have an abundant life. I'm a giving God. I want to give to you. I'm a great giver, and I love giving. I'm not stingy. So when Jesus was telling his disciples about this father-child relationship, he says, ask and it'll be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it'll be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be open. For which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If then you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father, who is in heaven, Good, give, good, give good gifts to those who ask him. He says, you guys can ask me. You can ask. I'm, I'm your father. You can ask. You can knock. You can tap on my door in prayer. I'll answer you. You guys get it because you've got your own kids and you love to give to them. Grandparents, you love to give to your grandkids, right? You love to spoil your grandkids. They come and ask you for something and your heart goes, oh man, I want to bless them. He says, you've got a weakness side. You've got a sinful side to you and yet you're good to your kids. How much more is your father good to his children? See, God loves to give. We're in a, we're in a giving, receiving relationship with God. Did you know that? God loves to give to you. Some of you aren't, aren't receiving all that God wants to give because you don't believe that, but he's a generous, loving God. In fact, he gives us not only physical blessings, he gives us emotional, sometimes you know, mental, spiritual blessings as well. For example, it says in the book of James, the first chapter, if any one of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and he'll be given him. Not just, he won't just give you wisdom, he'll give you generously. That's the kind of God he is. A little bit later, James says, every good and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. Our heavenly daddy loves to give. He loves to give so much that in the book of Romans chapter 8, verse 32, it says, he who did not spare his own son. God loved you so much. Gave his one and only son. Didn't hold him back. He's a generous God. He says, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? You think Jesus was the greatest gift from God, and God says, but that's not the end. I want to give you even more. He, says, I want to. he showed how gracious he is, and he says, I want to give you graciously even more. So I'm trying to embed in your head this view that God loves to give. He really does. And he loves gracious receivers who receive from him and say, thank you, Father. And what I found is, is when you have a love language, if you have the love language like um, you love to give words of affirmation, you probably love to receive words of affirmation too. It's like you speak that language. And if God loves to give, we know that God also loves to receive back from his children. That's why we see that all through the Bible. God, it's not that he needs anything, it's just he loves to see his kids gratefully give back to him. And I had a, a picture of this several years ago, and um, little, little grandson Aiden was there. Aiden's over here. There you are. And uh, he was about three years old. He sat on my lap, and I poured him a great big bowl of kettle corn from Costco. 
You know, they got these big puffy kernels, real sweet and salty, real good. So he, he reaches onto his bowl. He's sitting on my lap, and he eats a bite of it. And I'm watching a TV show or watching a football game. He reaches over and sticks one in front of my mouth. So I gobble it up. And he smiles, and he's kind of cute. So he eats another one, and then he puts another one over to my mouth, and I eat it again, and he smiles at me, and, and he's having fun giving and eating at the same time. So he's eating, giving, eating, giving, eating, giving. After a while, his fingers are getting a little sticky. I say, you can have the rest. <laughs> I'm done. I'm, I'm full. So uh, he finishes it. And I got to thinking later of, of his, his attitude. Why was it so fun for him to give to me? I mean, he could have said, hey, that's my kettle corn. Get your own. Why did he love to give it? Here's what I think. I think he's thinking, I'm Baba, by the way. Baba gave it to me. And if I run out, Baba will give me more. Because it wasn't mine in the first place. It was his. So, so he's of the mindset of, oh, Baba gave it to me for free. So he's probably going to give me more if I run out. And the second part is he found joy in sharing, in giving back. Do you ever think that when you give back to God, not because you have to, but because you want to, your heavenly father goes, oh, that means so much to me. Because you want to. You're not being forced to do it. You're actually delighting in giving back. See, that's the attitude the New Testament speaks of. Paul's writing to the church in Corinth. And, and again, he doesn't talk about tithing, but he talks about giving. And then he says this about the attitude we have in giving. Each one must give as he has decided or she has decided. You get to decide. You get to decide. In your heart, not reluctantly, nor under compulsion. Nobody's forcing you, twisting your arm. You get to choose for God loves a cheerful giver, which is why we cheer when it's time for the offering because I get to do this now. Nobody's going to shame you for what you don't give. Nobody's going to applaud you for what you do give. It's a gift to God. It's you're telling your heavenly daddy, thank you for what you've given me. It's the measure you're using to give back to him. You get to decide. Now, to me, that opens up this whole new window. Like, well, if I get to decide, why would, why would I want someone else to tell me how much? Why would I want to be limited by that? See, here's the danger of the rule. Now, I'm not against tithing at all. I think it's a great starting point. But it's been told to me that it's like training wheels for giving. It's not the pinnacle. It's a good foundation. It's a good discipline. But, but, but don't ever see that that's the end of it. Because it'd be like a guy who's dating this girl, and he reads in a book that for Valentine's Day, you should get your girlfriend roses. So he goes out, buys a dozen roses, brings him to her apartment, shows up, and she sees him out the window and goes, oh my goodness, he's bringing me flowers. Can't believe it. He shows up there and, and he hands her the flowers and says, uh, I was reading this book this week and it said that um, if I really love somebody, I should give them flowers. So that's, that's kind of what people do. So here you go. Now, how do you think she'd feel? He's doing it because that's what the book says. He's doing it because that's the standard. That's the kind of the rule. That's what you do. He's just taken, he's taken the heart out of the gift. It'd be far better if he just said, you know what? I've got a few roses here or here's some tulips. But you know, babe, you mean the world to me. And my life has never been as happy as it's been since I've come to know you. Happy Valentine's Day. Doesn't that mean a lot more? Because it's, it's, it's coming from here. That's why Paul is, is saying this. He said, you get to decide, but make sure it comes from the heart. Tell God how much you love him by your giving. In Acts chapter 11, there was a time when the church was in a famine. And the churches were being invited. Hey, if you want to help out that struggling church over there, we're going to take a collection. And it says, so the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. You got to determine. What did you want to contribute? It's going to be up to you. You get to choose. See, giving isn't a requirement to, see, to receive God's grace. It's not like I better tithe so I make God happy and get his blessings. Giving is a response to the grace I've already received. I've already received great grace. I give because of what he's already done for me. Do I want more blessings? Of course. But I want to give because of love, not the law. I want to give because of the relationship, not because of the rule. And when you look at the New Testament... And I look at the people who are kind of commended for their giving, highlighted. It's people like this. 
It's Zacchaeus who meets with Jesus and then comes out of his house and says, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. It's the woman who's a widow who takes two little coins that are worth about a penny, puts them in the offering canister, and Jesus said she gave more than anybody else because she gave all she had. It's, um, it's Barnabas in the New Testament selling a piece of property, bringing it to the church and saying, hey, we know there are needy people. Take this money, distribute it to those that have needs. It's the church in Macedonia that Paul writes about in 2 Corinthians 8 that Paul says they were in extreme poverty and yet their hearts welled up in rich generosity. They begged for the privilege to give to the needs of other churches. And see, none of these people tithed. They actually gave way beyond the tithe. Why? Because God was doing something in their hearts. Um, I think so often we, we want to strive toward like a foundation for the rule. Like, and I found in my own life, yes, it was really good for me for many years to tithe. But I have to tell you that if I did that when our family was young and it was hard, don't, shouldn't there come a place where when it's easier, I would grow and mature? It kind of goes along with um, tipping, my growth in tipping. Like when I was a young single guy, I thought tipping was, was, was ridiculous. I mean, if you ate at fast food places, you didn't tip, why do I have to tip at the sit-down restaurant? Why don't they pay their... Bill, here's what I tell them. You, 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 you employees get a better job. You know, don't, re, don't rely on my tip to, to make your salary. And so I, I kind of reluctantly tipped. Sometimes 10%, sometimes maybe 15%. I mean, 15% is kind of the standard, but I would do 10 to 15% because people said 10% is pretty good too. And then when I got older, especially got married and went to restaurants, I started to look differently, especially when we went out to California to see our daughter. Stephanie was in college. She worked weekends at a French restaurant. So we went out to her restaurant one Friday night. Uh, French restaurants can be expensive. We found that out pretty quickly looking at the menu. And, oh, my goodness. So we racked up a pretty good bill just eating a pretty simple meal. Fortunately, the, uh, the owner uh, gave her a couple desserts to bring out to our table that were complimentary. And then when we got the bill, we looked at it. And then we decided about the tip. You know that little line there, tip? And we thought, you know what? Our daughter just served, her, served us. We've been serving her for 20 years. This ought to be a freebie on, a, on her, right? <laughs> but no, we didn't. Instead, we, we tipped. But I'll tell you this, we didn't tip 15%. We tipped more. And you know why? Because of the relationship. And you know what, I, this is something for me personally. You don't have to do this, but this has been for me. I can be pretty cheap, and I can be pretty tight, and I've decided I'm never going I'm to, I'm, I'm not going to tithe 15% anymore. Standard for me is 20% now or more. And I, I, there's some things I won't, I won't order drinks sometimes because I want to tip more. And I said, I don't want the rule to be my standard. I want to be a generous person. And I think that's what God's getting at. Do you know that in heaven we'll be giving? I mean, read through that. In, in heaven, the elders are bowing down and they're laying their crowns at Jesus' feet. The kings are entering into Jerusalem, flowing in, bringing their gifts. I mean, we're going to be giving through eternity. It says that all praise, all honor, all glory, you know, all wisdom, all riches and wealth, it all belongs to the Lord. We're going to be giving constantly to the Lord. Why? Because we're going to have fun doing it for eternity. Let's have fun doing it here on earth. When you came in, you got a, a little card. And I want to assure you, uh, this is not a card to make you feel guilty. It's not a ca card to put any pressure on you at all. But it is a card to challenge you. If, I want to challenge you in one of three ways. First, if, you've, if you're the kind of person that says, I give very sporadically, make a decision. I want to give. I want to start being a giver. God has given me so much. I want to start putting my measure before him. And maybe your measure is small. Maybe you're going to trust him in a little bit. But make a decision. I'm going to trust God with this amount. It could be an amount every week. It could be a certain percent. But I'm going to do this every week or every other week, once a month, whatever my paycheck is. That's what I'm going to do to the Lord. Make a commitment. Make giving a regular discipline in your life. For some of you who've been doing that, but you've never tithed, I encourage you to do that. It's a great standard. It's a great marker to say, I want to do that because it's, it's been proven for many Christians that that's just a great starting place to get to. So maybe for you, that's the jump to say, I'm going to trust God. It's a big jump for me, but I'm going to trust God and start tithing. I, I want to see God. I'm going to give a, a bigger measuring basket to him 
and see what God does in my life. And for some like me who've been tithing for many years, maybe it's time to say, isn't it time to stretch beyond that? Isn't it time to move beyond just the rule to beyond what God can do? Why? Not because you have to, but because you get to, because of the grace you've received. Uh, you heard a story last week from Bill and Kanani, and I want to share with you a story today from a young couple. This is like the opposite end of the spectrum. They're not even 30 years old, and uh, they've learned to trust God in this area of their life. I want you to hear what God has done in just two short years. The name's Trevor and Kara Little. Watch this story. Hi guys, I'm Trevor. This is my wife, Kara. Uh, we're the Littles. Uh, we've been coming to Pikes Peak Christian Church now since 2015. We were both baptized in 2016. Um, since that time, we've been involved in a couple different ministries. Uh, we help serve with, with ushering and communion. Kara is a part of the uh, childhood education. She's a base camp coordinator. And then uh, most recently, we are involved in Rooted. We're two of the new leaders of the Rooted program. So growing up, both of us, both of our families never talked about finances or money in general, never knew anything about tithing. We'd hear it in church service, um, but never about the importance of it. Uh, once we became a couple and going to church, tithing was very inconsistent and one of the last things on our list. So we would give $20 here, $50 here, maybe $100 if we were having a good month and some months not even at all. So the turning point for us um, was when we got to a point with our finances where we were basically sick and tired of, of being sick and tired. We are frustrated with living paycheck to paycheck, um, and we knew that we needed a change. A friend of mine at work listened to Dave Ramsey and, and his podcast and told me that it was working for him and his fiance. So I brought that home after listening to a couple episodes. Kara listened. We both got on board and really started to to dig in to our finances and how we could fix it. The big piece in that was changing God from our last priority of mm -hmm. 23, you know, $50 here to the number one priority and giving him the, the first fruits. And what really hit home for us was in Malachi 3.10, he says to test me on this and see if I won't open, you know, the windows of heaven and pour out those blessings on you. And so we were at the point where it was, what can it hurt to test God? Um, so we just started tithing all of that. We experience the blessings in multiple ways. They come in a lot of ways. For us, suddenly we, we weren't paycheck to paycheck. Even, I think, almost immediately, mm -hmm. uh, we had extra money in our bank account. And Trevor got two promotions that same year. I had a promotion in my job, so we just had more opportunities to make more, thus giving us more opportunities to give more. We also were able to be blessings to other people. We were able to give beyond our tithe and help those in need, and that was probably my favorite blessing, is that we are able to be blessings to other people. So the one um, other aspect that we really enjoyed of, of Dave Ramsey's plan was attacking our debt. It was very basic, simple steps, but it laid out a game plan for us to attack them one by one. Each one we completed, it gave us more and more freedom to tithe and, and, and enjoy other blessings too that, that helped remove stress from our lives. It really made a difference. And on top of him taking care of us and you know all those issues getting put aside, we just experienced an incredible amount of peace from our giving and getting ready for our debt, obviously. And we are able to give to things that come up that God puts in our vision, gives us that opportunity to just give again and give freely and joyfully. So where are we at now? Um, two years later, uh, we are debt free. Last Friday, we paid off $52,400. Uh, hallelujah. We are very <laughs> excited for that. And we're also excited for this next stage of life that, that God has in plan for us. Uh, so we've been renting a house. We currently have a down payment saved up um, to build the house that we want and, and just change into this new season for us. So the, the topic of, of tithing and finances is, is always a sensitive topic. We probably shared the same thoughts that, that many others did, that tithing can be a burden, making a budget can be restrictive, I can use that money for groceries or this or that. Um, but I'm 
here to tell you that we're examples that when you put God first in your life and make Him the true Lord of your life, including your finances, He's going to meet every single need. He's going to take care of you. He says this to us that we shouldn't worry about the basic needs. He asked us to, to test Him on that subject. We certainly did. We dove all in. And, and it paid off for us. Uh, once we put him first, all of our other issues and problems like debt seemed to fall by the wayside because he took care of us. Mm -hmm. I, I love their story because it's in such a short time, God turned it around. And uh, there's one message that came out real clear. It's put God first. Put God first. It's the relationship. Relationship drives everything else. And so we have an opportunity. And if you want to put your card in today, if you're not here tomorrow and want to do that, uh, nobody's going to follow you up with phone calls. I'm going to ask our ushers, by the way, to go ahead and go to the back to get ready for our offering. Nobody's going to uh, hassle you, uh, but it's for you and God and, and you and what God's doing through your church to say, like, I want to grow in this area. So I, I want to... I want to make a commitment because I want this to be a time when I'm going to change in my approach to this subject. This is a time to do that. We're going to pray over, over you and that God would, would, would bless you as you trust him in this area of your life. So at a, a moment, the ushers are going to come down and, and we're going to take our, our offering for today and receive your gifts, your tithes, your offerings, your expressions of love to your Heavenly Father. And uh, again, we don't want you to feel manipulated by any way. Uh, you get to choose the measure you use God says, I will feel pressed down, packed down, overflowing, because that's the kind of God I am. So uh, let's pray as our ushers come forward to receive our offering. Father, we thank you for the privilege right now that we have to give back to you. Lord, I thank you that you're a generous God. You're not a, a God that's hanging rules over us that you're going to curse us if we don't do this. But you're a God who wants to bless us, I, I think, Lord, more than we would ever imagine. So help us to catch a vision of that, to not restrict what you want to do in our lives, but to embrace all that you have to give us. Thank you for being so generous. You've been that way in the past. We know that you'll be that in the future. And so we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you again uh, for being here. If you're a guest at Pikes Peak Christian Church, we're so glad that you're here today. Um, we have one more week. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about part three in the series. And uh, part three will be about um, partnership. And so if you uh, didn't pick up one of these last week while in the service, I think there, were, there may still be some available at the um, connection counter. And even if you don't have a card like this every day on our Facebook page, we're putting up a little prayer thought for that day. Something just to get your mind oriented, to say thank you to God, to pause, to, to acknowledge God in an area of your life. And so this has been a little bit of a guide that you can follow as we go through this series. Uh, in your bulletins is information about the various classes going on in the church. Today at this service, we have part one of the membership class. Obviously, you're not there because you're here. But if you'd like to catch part two, um, come at the 915 service next week. Go to the membership class at 11 o'clock, and then we can help you fill in on the first part of that as well. There's some other new classes being started um, on some sensitive areas. You can read that in your bulletin. Also want to let you know that every Thursday, there's a group of us that pray. We do, we do this Probably 50 weeks a year, we meet in front of the fireplace, and we pray over the needs in this church family. And if you fill out one of those cards on the back of the chair in front of you, our connection cards, you have a right of prayer request on there, um, we pray over those, and we lift them up before the Lord. God really wants to intervene in your life. And if you have any questions from the Lord, you need someone to pray with, Pastor Rick's going to be available up front here after service. Um, and any of our prayer partners could be available up here as well to minister to you. Uh, maybe there's a struggle you're going through in your life. Uh, maybe the situation with Gannon has affected you and you'd like someone to pray with. Uh, they're, they're here for you as well. So let's go ahead and stand and we'll close in prayer. Well, Father, thank you for a beautiful morning. Thank you for a beautiful day. Another gift that you give us, Lord. It's the middle of winter, and yet it's 67 degrees outside. So we're going to go enjoy it, and we give you praise for it. Lord, we thank you that you pour out abundant blessings to us um, every single day, and for that we're grateful. Lord, help us to be a blessing in our homes. Help us to be a blessing in our neighborhoods. I pray that we could be a blessing in our jobs to the people we work with. We know that there are people all around us that wonder what it's like to be a Christian. And I pray, Lord, that the way we live would convey to them, it is a wonderful thing to be a child of God. It really is. And so we give you thanks, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.